Thanks for joining the webinar, everyone. Today, we'll be discussing how modernizing your identity governance and administration platform is crucial for organizations to manage identities effectively and remain competitive and secure. Uh, one of the main ways we show this is through an IGA strategy, removing your legacy IGA systems and moving towards um, a zero trust model. So let me introduce myself. I'm Paul Gagaki. I'm a managing director out of Ohio. Um, I've been in the identity space for around 15 years and um, mainly focused on strategies over the last couple of years. And I'll hand it over to Dylan. Hi, my name is uh, Dylan Kessler. I'm based out of Austin, Texas. I've been with Agile for a little over seven and a half years, primarily in the identity space. I'm a senior architect uh, working on various industries, including finance, uh, banking, construction, uh, healthcare, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll pass it over to Helio. Hello, my name is Helio Gomez. I am a, a, a senior architect as well uh, here at Agile. I've been in the identity space for about 17 years now, uh, primarily working on healthcare and banking and telecom uh, projects. And I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Mike Kessler. Thanks, Helio. I'm uh, Mike Kaiser. I'm the Directory of Director of Standards and Strategy at StalePoint, where I've been since about 2015. Member of several internet working groups, and I've been in the identity security industry for about 15 to 20 years. And I'm just excited to be able to hop on and talk about zero trust and the role identity plays in that with my friends from Agile. Thanks for having me, Paul. Great. So for today's agenda, we'll go have a little bit of background on who Agile is and what we do. We'll go through why legacy solutions don't work. This is especially true when we start talking about legacy authentication uh, and our identity migration methodology and timeline. Um, then Mike will present on why SailPoint for modern identity security. Next, we'll go through why zero trust and why it's so important to move a move to a modern identity architecture. Finally, we'll walk through a couple cases and how to get started. But first, a little background on who we are. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know us, we're a consulting company based out of Austin, Texas, uh, with many of us spread out across the United States. There are three core things we do. Uh, cloud security focused on Microsoft, governance, risk and compliance with a strong relationship with ServiceNow, and last, identity and access management. Agile serves more than 45 companies in the Fortune 500, including more than 12 in the Fortune 100. Uh, we have a senior team with professionals with an average of 10 plus years experience, uh, with many of us coming from a big four background. Now with the recent acquisition by Wipro, we have a better together story by deepening and widening our skill set and breadth of services we can offer. OK, uh, we'll start with Dylan speaking on why legacy solutions don't work. Thanks, Paul. So the, you know, in the modern security arch uh, architecture and namespace, why do legacy solutions not work? There's a couple of re main reasons. Uh, one of the big ones is your actual security. Uh, a lot of legacy solutions, they're just not even supported anymore or the support that they do get, they're not getting, you know, updates on a regular basis. So just they're flat out vulnerable to network attacks. Uh, but even beyond that, they don't support a zero trust security model necessary for your modern security art posture. Uh, also, with your increasing regulatory requirements on a regular basis, those legacy solutions don't really support the continuous monitoring and reporting requirements that that are being driven by your those rec increased requirements. Uh, those legacy solutions also, both from a cost perspective and an operational and complexity perspective are not built for the modern cloud architecture and uh, space. Uh, they don't scale. They don't really support a lot of the, you know, your cloud apps in the uh, the modern space. They struggle to keep up from both the performance and scalability uh, structure. And with the trend moving toward the cloud and eliminating those, you know, on-prem costs, you know, those legacy solutions, you know, keep kind of having those technical debt. And also with the time to market for those legacy solutions, you just don't really have 
you know, the ability to kind of be agile with those legacy solutions. The modern, you know, the just your average modern identity solution is going to be more agile because those legacy solutions just are way more burden, some way more costly. So uh, on the next slide, please. So let's say you've decided to migrate from a legacy solution to a modern solution. A couple of uh, best practices and common challenges to think of. Uh, you know, in the don'ts, you know, there's a couple of ideas like don't migrate broken processes and avoid bing bang application migrations. So when you're doing these migrations, you want to basically avoid migrating everything all at once. If you do so, one point of failure is going to mess up and ruin the entire migration. You want to do these migrations as a piecemeal so that you can get these easy wins, but also so that you can prepare from a operational change management approach to make sure that your you know, end users, both from an IT perspective as well as your end business users, are prepared for this migration. Also, when it comes to the application migration, you can migrate these apps. You want to migrate these apps in a prioritized wave or phase migration using an agile methodology so that the account and entitlement intake can be validated incrementally. And Agile has actually developed a prioritized framework to help with this. Um, in terms of the do's that you want to do, quote unquote, uh, you want to prepare for a temporary coexistence. Um, this kind of goes along with the avoid the big bang approach, but if you're migrating everything all at once, uh, or if you're migrating everything in a piecemeal approach, there's going to be a period of time where you're having both the legacy solution and the modern solution uh, on at the same time, and you want to be prepared for this and know what parts of the legacy solution and what parts of the modern solution are going to be on at the same time so that you can be prepared for this, both from a change management approach as well as making sure that you know which, you know, parts are going to be on. And a best practice here is to migrate the back office automation processes first, and then the complex and user functionality last, so that you can have a stable new, you know, modern solution available before introducing those major changes that are going to impact the end users. Uh, building Greenfield goes along with don't migrate those broken processes. You want to make sure that you're migrating and building this pr these processes that are going to be good for the modern, you know, the modern name sp or space that your business needs, not migrating, you know, processes that may or may not work for the modern space just because they existed previously. And that might mean making some changes that you have depending upon what your business needs going forward. Uh, and finally, communication outreach is key. Uh, this is especially important when it comes to end users, to knowledge transfer to your IT, uh, and making sure that you have that sustained focus and commitment with your key technical and business stakeholders in order to make sure that you it reduce your organizational risk, you boost your productivity, and you improve your end user experience so that you have a successful migration going forward. Uh, and with that, I will pass it back to Paul. Thanks, Dylan. So having been through several legacy solutions uh, to modern IG platform transitions myself, I agree that uh, I agree that with making that move, it's a perfect opportunity to fix and update broken processes and procedures. Um, so next we'll, we're going to have Helio talk about Agile's identity migration methodology and timeline. Thank you. Uh, so to kind of piggyback on what Dylan was saying there, uh, Agile has a, a six step migration methodology that we've used uh, countless times to help get our customers from a legacy solution to a modern identity uh, per, uh, platform. So if we take a look here, we have the, the six steps up here. So it's pr pretty much broken down into two different phases. We have the analysis and design phase up at the top. And at the bottom, we have the actual building phase. It is incredibly important that you do the analysis and design prior to doing the building. You cannot just start building things and hope they work. You wanna make sure that you've properly planned and figured out what you need to build before you build it. So to do that, we start in our first step in the top left here, uh, the current state evaluation. So this is where we're looking at either your uh, existing legacy solution or uh, what processes you have in place that are currently not within an identity solution now. 
Uh, so we're going to take all of that information in. We're going to determine what we need to do to get from where we are now to where we want to be in a modern platform. Uh, so that brings us to the gap analysis. The gap analysis is where we figure out what those gaps are, as well as uh, figuring out what new processes we want to be able to, to implement and what current processes we need to change so that we can have our modern platform. Uh, our data modeling step, that is where we're leveraging the uh, uh, prioritized framework that uh, Dylan alluded to earlier. Uh, that prioritized framework is going to allow us to figure out what data we're going to need in our modern solution in order to fulfill all the needs of our requirements. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to plan all of that out, we're going to document it, we're going to figure out everything that we need to build, then we're going to start building. That's where we drop down into the second phase here with our uh, modern core deployment. So that core deployment is just the baseline feature set of the new identity platform. We're going to have possibly some very simple connectors to pull data in, make sure we're getting our data in, make sure we're uh, handling uh, all of our use cases appropriately, and that our, our data is doing exactly what we want it to do. Once we have that, we're going to move into our second phase of, of our building, which is the identity lifecycle events. These are our joiner processes, our mover processes, our lever processes, all of the things that we're going to need to do to get our users in from our authoritative sources into our uh, downstream systems. The last phase there is the application migration. This is where we're taking the prioritized applications and we're going through them and adding them into Identity IQ or whatever our, our prioritized uh, or our modern platform is uh, to actually have more downstream systems involved. And that's not going to be a, a single big bang approach where we try and get everything in. As Dylan alluded to earlier, we're going to use an agile process to slowly build up everything that we're going to want to get in there over time. Uh, so if we take a look at the next slide, the next slide shows kind of a, a sample timeline of what we're looking at here. So in phase one, that's where we're doing all of that analysis and design. Uh, very, very little hands on keyboard development there. Uh, maybe some like proof of concept or something along that line, but we're not going to be doing any of, of the actual build at that point. Uh, once we have that plan that we've uh, determined through that analysis and design, then we start building in phase two. And in phase two, we have a go live with just the core system in, in, the, in diamond one here. And in diamond two, uh, we're going to have our uh, initial joiner mover lever processes and other life cycle events as needed. Phase three is the, uh, the full go live with all of our downstream systems that are currently part of our legacy system so that we can retire the legacy system. And then from there on, it's going to be feature enhancements, adding in new applications, building upon our, our foundation that we've set for ourselves and moving forward into the future. So I'm going to pass it off here to Mike Kaiser to show how SailPoint works in the uh, into the solution. Thanks, Helio. You know, uh, when you're uh, trying to modernize your IGA, your identity infrastructure, uh, you know, you want someone with you who's been there before. And frankly, that's SailPoint. Uh, we have, along with the leaders in identity governance, we helped define and transform the space, uh, working with PAM, working with other components within security architecture to enrich it with identity context. And we do that via our identity platform that's powered by ML and AI and some machine learning techniques that are applied in specific use cases uh, to embrace a cloud-first identity model. Uh, things are very distributed, things are ephemeral these days, and you need something with the speed and scale that AI and ML and that kind of a hands-off approach learning model can provide you. Uh, that is really what sets you up for identity in the modern enterprise. Visibility into all applications, no matter if they're on premise, they're in the cloud, cloud native, wherever they are, finding them, abstracting their access model, and then using identity to govern them well. And on the next slide, you can see that the reality today, uh, providing identity security for a cloud enterprise is no longer so simple as it used to be, as we all know, right? Because not only are your applications, your data, your resources that you're trying to protect, not only are those out distributed in the cloud, but over the last few years, your identities have become distributed as well. Employees working from home, 
consumers or, or, or vendors uh, logging in from afar. Uh, no longer do you have a network perimeter you can rely on to identify uh, who people are and whether they have good or bad intentions. So what you need is something that is native to the cloud and understands the cloud and can govern the cloud well and embrace its distributed nature. And when you do that on the next slide, you can see that the power of the cloud is actually unlocked because you can modernize your identity security, modernize your strategy for security with the speed and scale that cloud promises. You can provision and know it's going to happen just in time. You can protect your resources at speed and at scale as they come up, as they fade away, they're always protected because the machine is machine learning model can embrace them very quickly, quicker than any human can. And then on the on the tail end, you can prove that you've done what you said you were going to do, that you've protected those resources, you've secured your infrastructure, you've reduced risk to the business, all with the policies and the plan you set in the first place. And these days, a lot of people are calling this zero trust. And really, that's what we always should have been doing from the beginning, relying on identity rather than some type of network infrastructure uh, to really help us govern and modernize our security strategy. And the way we do that is by using someone like SailPoint to modernize your identity security and thus facilitate zero trust. Now, to see how zero trust plays out in the rest of the enterprise, I'm going to hand back to my agile friends to talk about zero trust and their approach. Thanks, Mike. Uh, now we're going to hand it back to Helio to uh, allude on what Mike just talked about: zero, how zero trust fits in with the modern identity architecture. Thank you all. Uh, so Mike made an extremely good point uh, in his presentation there uh, where he was talking about legacy systems and legacy security and how the legacy security framework ended at the perimeter. So we, we think the bad guys are out here. Our stuff is in here and we want to get keep the bad guys here and the good guys here. Uh, in a modern uh, in our modern world, we don't have the bad guys out here and the good guys over here. We have the good guys and the bad guys all thrown around all over the place altogether. Why is that? Because not only are our uh, network our, our network is not contained inside of one location anymore. We have cloud apps and SaaS infrastructure. We have people who are not working in the office anymore, maybe they can't VPN in. They have B, uh, BYOD devices. They're coming in from anywhere at any time. So we cannot stop our security at the perimeter anymore. And that's really the, the core concept that Zero Trust is trying to address. So when we have a Zero Trust environment, we don't care if that, uh, if that request for access is coming from inside our network or outside our network. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. It matters who it's coming from and what they're requesting. So and if we're looking at who it's coming from, what is the most important part of that? Knowing your identities. So you can't have a zero trust infrastructure without knowing who should be allowed to do what. So if we look here on this slide, on, uh, uh, that's up on the screen here. We see that we have our identities over here and on the top left and we have our devices that they're coming in from. We don't know if those devices are internal, external. We don't know if there are devices, some BYOD devices or some tablet that our user picked up off the street and figured out that, hey, I can log into this and I can go make a request to do my stuff. What we care about is, is the person making the request a, a good guy or a bad guy? So that's where our security and compliance engine comes in. Every single request that we have needs to be routed through our security and co um, compliance engine because we're always assuming that every single request was a breach. So we never trust it and we always verify it. Our security and compliance engine is built with a ton of rules to figure out who can access what and when and where and from why and why, whatever reason. So that is really the, the core concept of zero trust, always verify every single access because we never trust that that access request is coming from somebody that is a good actor. Everybody's a bad actor until proven otherwise. So we have our security and compliance engine that makes the decision. We get access if we are if we meet other requirements, but we don't stop there. It's a continuous verification. That person's going to make another request for access. 
does that uh, request for access make sense based on who they are? We don't know until we go and, and inspect that request in our security and compliance engine. So it's always a loop. Every single request is going to be verified. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see uh, <clears throat> kind of how all that plays into uh, with the identity solution. So here at the bottom, we have our foundation for our zero trust. What is their foundation for zero trust? It's identity. So we know who should have access because we have the authoritative sources telling us whether it's HR or our uh, vendor lists or our customer databases, depending on what the access request is for, they might all have valid reasons to make requests for our, our data. So those, those are coming in from our authoritative sources and those are going to be presented into our identity system, which is going to provision you out to the various applications, whether they're on-prem or in the cloud. And that's going to allow our security and compliance engine to make the, the correct decisions for what access should be granted and what should be denied. So we have a continuous uh, loop of certifications in there as well. Not only do we care about what your access was on day one when you started and your role when you started, we want to know at, at intervals of time, do you still need that access? You change from job A to job B, you are going to need different access. You continue doing your work and five applications have been uh, have been removed from your network and they've been replaced by other things. I don't need to be in the same security groups I was in anymore. So we're going to continually certify your access to make sure that the access that you have today is the access that you need today. We don't care what your access you needed yesterday was. We care what you need today. That's going to allow our, our compliance engine to make sure that whatever access you're requesting today is the access that you need. And we, we want to be not a barrier to our people uh, that are doing our good actors. We want to be a barrier to our bad actors, which means we need to have the right data for the decision engine to make the right decisions. And that is the core concept of zero trust. <clears throat> so what we're going to go on to now is a couple of case studies. I think we're going to throw that back to Paul uh, for our first case study. Yep, that's right, Helio. Um, yep. I'll jump into one. Uh, here we go. So uh, in this particular case study, we were working with a large manufacturer that's headquartered in the US, uh, but has operations around the world. Uh, they have about 70,000 employees and contractors, as well as vendors and suppliers, which were not in scope for this engagement, but it's something um, you know, we're looking at for uh, an external identity strategy in the, in the near future with them. Uh, the client has or had a, a 10 plus year old IM system that was oftentimes failing on provisioning requests, which would lead to uh, some audit findings. So um, they also had multiple ways to request access, which um, you know, which could lead to some confusion on where to go to relax, uh, to request access for you know what particular system. Um, let's see, their system had been around for so long, <clears throat> it actually turned into somewhat of a data mart. Um, and that's something we really, they, you know, they were unaware of until we got into uh, the strategy with them. So, um, something that uh, their their system had had morphed into something bigger than they originally had uh, had had, ex had uh, imagined it would be. Uh, so, so Edge was brought in. Uh, we did it by the IAM stakeholders to uh, assess the current state and maturity of their IAM controls for the employees, their warehouse workers, and contractors. Uh, we performed a six week strategy, which included interviews with um, 40 plus employees across different teams, including IT, marketing, um, cloud architecture, HR, and uh, and legal. Uh, the strategic roadmap outlined a future state vision that would require the client to invest in their IM program over the next uh, three years to get in a good spot and add some of the additional functionality that the client requested during the strategy. Um, in phase one, we got the infrastructure built and put in joiner lever, similar to the uh, you know what Helio was referring to earlier. Uh, not without some surprises, especially since the system had been around for ten plus years. We discovered that it was uh, storing fitness forms as well as other HR data, uh, which is something that you know came to light in the strategy, you know, which I mentioned. So uh, we jointly came up with a plan on how to decouple that, uh, especially because you don't want non-identity data, you know, in your in your HR system and um other things were happening in there too that you know just that's why we had to have legal involved and figure out where to put certain and certain pieces of data so um that was phase one 
phase two was an additional nine months where we continued onboarding applications, uh, set up consolidated access request portal, and developed additional additional use cases. Um, and we also showcased the access review pilot. Uh, the access review pilot was key because it helped build the case to roll out the software to additional stakeholders and, and get their buy-in. Uh, this was especially important because they were doing what you found in the strategy that they were doing access reviews in spreadsheets. Um, so um, when we think about the benefits, um, I think that they originally wanted a like-for-like -like replacement, but oftentimes with a system that's so old, you know, all the functionality uh, will not directly map over to the new system. So the, the client uh, took that opportunity to enhance and update their processes in ways that uh, they just weren't able to do in the old system. So, um, you know, the automated access reviews in a, in a system being one of the biggest benefits. Um, now I'll hand it off to Helio for the second use case. Yeah, so our second case study that we uh, are going to be going through today is uh, similar in nature, uh, but very different at the same time. Uh, so this was a, uh, a cable television provider. They have about 40,000 or so uh, employees and contractors uh, and various other types of users uh, throughout their, their, their network. Uh, they service over 5 million customers in 21 states, so they're they're fairly large. Uh, their current environment, when we came on uh, on site initially, was a, an identity platform that they'd had around for 20 years. Um, it had fallen out of support with the vendor. Uh, the vendor was no longer uh, providing any meaningful updates to the product. They, their staff that had been uh, servicing their identity uh, platform uh, had all left, so they had nobody on on site to be able to handle any problems within their uh, their identity network or identity platform, uh, which was a very major problem for them. Uh, additionally, they were running into issues with uh, their licensing, where their licensing was going to expire, uh, so that kind of threw a, a core business need where they really needed to have everything uh, performing pretty quickly for them in a new environment. Uh, additionally, uh, their current system did not support access reviews at all, so to stay in compliance with all of their uh, regulatory audits, they needed to do everything manually, and that was causing major pain for them as well. Uh, so if we skip down to the next slide here, uh, we'll show you how we attacked the problems with them. Uh, so instead of doing a six week uh, evaluation in the uh, the first thing, we, we cut that down into four weeks to kind of hit their timeline a little bit better. Um, in that time, we figured out quite a few things. Uh, one of the biggest things that we, we figured out was that their identity system was also their authentication system for a lot of their applications. And we really wanted to decouple that in their modern platform to not necessarily be using their identity platform for their uh, direct authentication requests. We wanted to have something else that was handling authentication, but was being backed by the identity solution to provide the identities that could authenticate. Uh, so that's where we configured a VDI in our first phase for them. Um, as well, we kind of combined phases one and two uh, for <clears throat> from our previous methodology, uh, and it really got that core uh, installation done and the, then built the joiner mover lever processes uh, in our first go live. So we only had a single go live for those first two phases. Um, we identified Identity IQ as the proper tool for them. Uh, we built out their joiner move reliever processes uh, and, and all of their core uh, HR domains and AD domains. They had uh, five AD domains that we're going to be, uh, that, that we were uh, provisioning to. Uh, we also created an access request portal for them uh, so that they could request access. Uh, that allowed us to have a foundation to set up their access reviews, which we, we did in uh, phase two, uh, as well as RBAC, because now we were able to do some uh, role mining and figure out which roles we could set up for them. Uh, so in phase one, we we stuck primarily with some, some core operating applications. Uh, so as we can see here, it says uh, HR and AD. Uh, we also added a couple of database applications that they needed for uh, uh, some of their core business uh, <coughs> uh, applications. Uh, additionally, in phase two, we added uh, ServiceNow um, and we identified about five or six other applications uh, that we were that we are going to be 
uh, bringing in through a more agile approach, uh, adding applications as we can and integrating them into those join, remover and lever processes where necessary and definitely into the access request portal. Uh, so right now, I think we have about three of those applications in place uh, and we're going to continue to be uh, building upon that uh, foundation that we've laid for them. Uh, so right now they're they're experiencing some uh, great benefits. Main one being that they have staff on hand to handle any issues that they have and to actually build on their platform. Uh, they were in 100% maintenance mode with a 20 year old platform that wasn't doing anything for them um, and just trying to keep the lights on. Um, unfortunately, that was easier said than done. Uh, now they have a modern platform that they have staff that understands it. Uh, they have Agile to reach out to as well uh, to, to guide them down their journey into a, a modern identity platform. Uh, so I think I'm throwing it back to Paul now uh, to go over how to get there from here. Yep, thanks Helio. Uh, so those were great case studies <clears throat> showcasing uh, how effective a strategy can be in laying the foundation for a, a purposeful roadmap. Um, next is how to get started, but but first let me walk you through our strategy process at a high level. So when moving from uh, left to right, we categorize the overall strategy process as uh, consisting of uh, the strategy, the program, deployment, and operation. Uh, we think about a strategy with a client. We we tackle it from two directions: a top-down approach, getting business alignment by looking at regulatory and compliance drivers, um, audit issues, who the leaders are in the IAM space, and seeing how market trends fit into the organization. Um, such as, is your organization cloud first? Because that will greatly impact um, you know how we think about the strategy and and the outcome. A bottoms-up approach looks at the risks inside and outside of the client's industry. Uh, we use a CMMI maturity model that reviews all aspects of IAM capabilities such as uh, the lifecycle management, the access request management, uh, audit and reporting certifications, uh, policies and standards, and then we rate them on a scale from one to five. Then we work with the client to understand where they want, where they should be on that scale and uh, build the future state off that. Combining uh, both of those approaches allows us to have a holistic view of the client's needs. Now, also in this strategy, we put together an overall program view, uh, taking into account everything we learned through conversations with the business uh, and reviewing architectures. We propose a future state vision and, uh, and a three to five year roadmap. Uh, next, we think through the deployment. How long would it take? What should be prioritized first, second, third? Uh, is there an immediate compliance need that needs to be addressed first? Uh, items, like that, items like that are taken into account with the deployment and operational view of the process. Um, last is, is the client going to support this moving forward? Uh, or how is the client going to move this um, moving forward? And what are the estimated costs associated with it? You know, will the client need additional resources to maintain the system? And what skill set should they have? Um, just a few things we think through and collaborate on with the client that's uh, incorporated into the, the strategy. So uh, to summarize how we do our strategies, um, we do current state, future state, and roadmap. Um, along with that, we typically put together an executive deck uh, and can, uh, and oftentimes we do assist, um, assist taking that executive deck to uh, to management with the, you know, with the client. So the current state consists of gathering current architecture, meeting with various stakeholders such as IAM manager, um, the CISO, the CIO, you know, from an IT strategy perspective. There's audit <clears throat> risk and compliance from an assurance perspective. Uh, there's HR from S and legal, um, like I mentioned before. And then, you know, there's sometimes we, there's conversations we have that, um, you know, we didn't didn't anticipate when we first started the strategy. So it all just depends on, on how those first initial ones um, um, take place. Um, so the future state consists of streamlining those processes through a conceptual architecture and then defining the business benefits based on certain use cases. Uh, the implementation roadmap and migration plan uh, sets the tone for implementing features and processes uh, first that are more critical in nature. And this allows us to build that, you know, next, you know, three plus years and what it would look like for, for the program. Um, so the deck allows us to take what we learned and build a case for modernizing the client's uh, IGA program and help disseminate that information to management, um, like I mentioned. 
So how do we get started? Um, we recommend getting in touch with us to start the process of collaborating on a strategy and laying the foundation for the next next three to five years. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, we follow a proven and structured framework. Uh, if you're thinking about updating your old legacy and modernizing your IM program. If you're still managing access reviews and spreadsheets or any other reason, you know, a strategy is a is a great place to start. So um, in, when you're going through this, this this process, you know, as an enterprise, you should start thinking about what are my risks and priorities? Am, am, I, am I using the right metrics? What types of expertise do I need? Have I incorporated governance risk and compliance? Um, and we can wrap all that up and put it in a strategy and, and help you um, sell that to uh, to management. Uh, we've had clients where sometimes these projects are driven by a compliance issue, such as a SOX finding that um, you know that caused a material weakness. But sometimes um, you need more of a strategic point of view to help build the case of modernizing your your IGA platform. We found these um, strategies greatly help with building that case and uh, helping you um, secure funding for uh, for some of those future phases. Moving on, so that concludes this webinar. Um, we have an upcoming webinar, um, so if you enjoyed this one today uh, on March 31st, join us to hear how we will uh, be helping companies re-envision their consumer experience and deploy a modern world-class user experience with uh, cloud-centric security. So um, that one has um, uh, Nikhil, Randy, and Michael from Agile, and we also have uh, Anand from Intac Insurance joining us. So um, if you're looking for more resources or more information um, you, or you want to contact us, feel free to reach out to uh, info at agile.com. There's also three links here uh, to learn more about Agile programs as well as um, a link uh, to learn more about their product. So uh, we'll open up to Q&A now. Uh, I guess if you have uh, any questions, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, give me a second here. All right, it looks like uh, we have a couple. Um, can you shed some light into why IGA is fundamental to a zero trust strategy? Mike, is that one you can take? Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, you know, really, as I alluded to before, zero trust is really at its core that raising the prominence of identity. And it kind of does it in four ways. First, it just makes sure that you have identities for everything and that those identities are accurate and the data in those identities is accurate. Because if you're going to have a policy based on the identity and the identity is flawed, well, that policy is not going to work so great, right? Second off, uh, general table stakes, things you think about when you think of zero trust, one of those things is just enough or least access, right? So least privilege. This makes sense, right? I want only people to have as much access as they need to do their job, but no more. Pretty straightforward there as well. From the identity, you can get to the policy, transit to least access. The third thing is limiting that least access or least privilege with a time constraint. In the ideal world, I don't want to have anyone to have access they're not currently using. So if I can reduce the amount of time they actually have valid access, the better off I am. This means that it means uh, enabling or, or granting entitlements just in the moment or just in time as they go to access it, removing them. Basically, this is reducing risk because if that identity is compromised, then they have access to all that stuff that they have access to. So the more you can reduce that time frame, the better. And then finally, uh, continually monitoring what you're doing, uh, your policies and the activity to see how can you improve, how can you close the loop, how can you make uh, things better? How can you make your zero trust uh, more robust and better fit how you do business, thus enabling access while ensuring the risk to the business is reduced? And so all of those things, uh, uh, the identities, the least privilege, the just-in-time nature of it, and continuous monitoring, all of that uh, uses the identity to form that foundation or that core part of zero trust, along with the other things that Agile has already talked about. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, another question that came in, how long do these strategies and deployments take? Um, I, I can take that one. So uh, strategies, you can, I guess if you were to time box it, it's typically maybe four to six, may, maybe eight weeks. Um, generally, they're a little bit shorter um, on the duration side, but 
um, de- they tend to run a little bit long. You know, we get the strategy done. A lot of it's dependent upon, you know, um, uh, the, the client availability, and then uh, we get the strategy together. And then it may take a little bit longer as we, you know, as we take it up through the chain through management, uh, based on schedules and things like that. That tends to make it run a little bit longer. So I'd say, you know, initial strategy done, you know, four to six weeks, and then, you know, we'll help um, disseminate that throughout the organization. Uh, and how long do deployments take? Uh, that's a, that's a depends question too. You know, size of the organization, um, so many different variables in there. Um, how many applications you want to onboard? You know, if we're doing entitlement cleanups, if we're going to do roles, there's lot lots of different moving pieces that we could uh, slide in and out of these different phases. So um, that one's a little bit hard to to put a nail on. But if you know uh, if you have a specific request, you know, feel free to reach out to me and we can we can discuss that. Um, what are technical items that you look for in a modern IGA platform? That yeah, I'll, Dylan I'll or Dylan? That one. I'll okay. start with that one. Um, so from my standpoint, the very first thing that I'm looking at when I'm doing a vendor selection typically would be, is there support for the applications that I intend to connect currently? Uh, and are, does the vendor have a strategy for adding new applications as time goes on? So we don't want to just have like, here's my little box that I have now. Uh, the case study that uh, I talked to earlier, case study two, uh, they're in the process of evaluating new HR sources. And one of the criteria was we want to have something that, that because we selected SailPoint Identity IQ, does the new HR source have support from SailPoint? Because if it doesn't, then we're going to have to rebuild our entire uh, identity platform around something that there isn't support for. So we have, for, we are fortunate with SailPoint that they have a very robust collection of uh, out of the box connectors, uh, so that that doesn't limit our options very much at all. Uh, another thing that I'm typically looking for is a, a cloud focus, whether that's uh, not just necessarily with is my platform cloud or not, but do I have the ability to interact with cloud apps? Because uh, a lot of our apps are moving cloud-based. Uh, so if you're looking at HR and you're doing something like Workday or uh, uh, SAP success factors, am I going to have problems trying to pull that data in? And that's not something that we want to have be a limitation to us. Uh, Dylan, do you have anything that you wanted to add? I'm sure you do. Uh, yeah, so other things that, you know, in addition, Helio definitely brought up some uh, really good things to look for. Um, other things that I like to look for when I'm, you know, kind of looking at these strategies and deployments might include the end user uh, experience. You know, for instance, does the uh, does the uh, modern IGA platform that you're looking at have a robust, you know, user interface both on a desktop browser, but also on a mobile browser. A lot of end users are, you know, starting to look at these systems uh, on their phones themselves or on like a, you know, maybe a tablet or stuff like that. And you want to make sure that uh, these systems, you know, play well when they're looked in that sort of interface. Uh, but also an end user, you know, experience from the regards to, you know, if this system is going to be performing certifications, you want to make sure that uh, those end users are going to have, you know, a nice interface and a nice interaction with that certification engine when they're actually performing the certifications themselves. Same thing when it comes to requesting access through the portal, uh, you know, or approving said access, you know, things like that. Um, so those are other really good, really important things to look at um, that I might, you know, consider in addition to, you know, some of the things that Helio mentioned. Cool. And then also just, you know, one other thing also is just what uh what roadmap do they have going forward? Uh not only just cloud, but in general, you know, do they have, you know, a roadmap of, you know, features and, you know, just planning and and ideas for, you know, their forward development. Um, you know, just a strategy for moving forward. You you always want them thinking of kind of the future, quote unquote. You know, it kind of sounds cliche almost, but it's kind of an important thing to think about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me see what else. Uh, do you recommend data cleanup? Is that something Dylan or I Helio? Could, I could take this one. Um, so data cleanup is always a tricky thing to think about, especially when you're building Evergreen, because 
you know, you got to balance, you know, on one hand, you might want to be balancing the kind of concept of quote unquote garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you're bringing in this kind of bad data, uh, you're you're going to have to deal with it. But on the other hand, you know, you also, to use another cliche, perfection is, the, you know, perfection is the enemy of, uh, you know, quote unquote. So one thing when I come to like data cleanup, the way I kind of approach it usually is uh, basically start data cleanup, you know, do some while you're doing the actual implementation, but don't let data cleanup be the factor that kind of prohibits you or prevents you from moving forward with the actual implementation. You know, maybe have like a defined goal or defined stopping point for data cleanup. So when you actually do the deployment in the end, you have better data than you started with, but you're never going to hit 100% data cleanup. Data is always going to be, you know, getting worse. You're always going to be having stuff happening. But at the same time, you know, just doing nothing means that you're going to have to deal with that longer and longer. So, you know, having that balancing point where you have these defined goals, you have these defined ways of cleaning up the data, but you also have a stopping point kind of helps with that kind of middle ground there. Yeah, absolutely, Dylan. What I've seen is um, starting that earlier, the better, um, you know, especially in phase one. That way, uh, when you actually go live, um, and you have the access request portal, it's easier to understand what you're actually requesting because a lot of times there's uh, entitlements in there for AD that just don't make sense to the end user. So if you can put um, clean that up and put better descriptions on those as well, that that helps quite a bit. And just right. to but add a little bit more to that timing, uh, when we're when we're going through our first phase there in the analysis and design, we have the data mapping. Uh, feature that we want to do. That's where we really want to figure out what those rules for the data cleanup are going to be. And we can start there uh, as soon as we're we're done with that data mapping exercise. And we understand where that data is coming from and what it needs to look like. That's where we do our cleanup and uh, we start the cleanup process in parallel with everything that we're working on and that way it can keep going through with the whole project and really be a supporting tool to the project and not a hindrance to it. Exactly. Yep. It right, looks like there's uh, a couple more here. Um, is this with identity now or IAQ or both? And then I think these might be connected cloud and on app. On prem apps uh, interested in the connectors. I think when yeah. I saw this come in, it was in relation to the zero trust model. So Mike, this might be a good one for you to take. Sure, like it, it really it's doesn't really matter that much, at least in, in my head and my thinking. You know, SailPoint, what we're providing is an identity platform that will govern everything, both on-premises and in the cloud. If you are all, all SaaS delivered and all cloud delivered, we can meet that model. If you have some kind of federal regulatory requirements that you have to be in a private cloud or you have to be even on-premises, we can make that model uh, and that architecture work for you as well. Um, don't, you know, uh, don't hear Agile talking about any particular version of the identity platform and think, oh, it's only that. It's, it's really any or all. Uh, we meet customers where they are is our goal. So we want to make it easier for you, not harder. Whatever you're good at, whatever you already have talent at and staffing resources that are accomplished at doing things, We'll lean into that and let you, uh, you know, use it and do what you do best and just get out of the way and let you do identity, not learn a new language or a new interface. Got it. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we have one last question here. Um, where does identity AI fit in this model? Any implementations that you have done using identity AI in the mix? Anyone? I can speak. I can speak <laughs> to the first part for darn okay. sure. Um, so look, you know, the way you heard me talk about ML and AI, right, in my little blabbering about SailPoint and about zero trust. Also, uh, the reality is that we're going to need something that is non-human to help us going forward. There are too many entitlements, too many identities, too many resources, especially when you're talking about a modern cloud-based architecture. Everything is ephemeral. It comes up, it goes away. What you need is something that can make those decisions for you. So what Identity AI does is part of that identity platform. You hear me talking about platform rather than you know products or solutions. Uh, what it does is it 
uses machine learning to learn what's in your environment, what's normal, and then it starts making recommendations to you as to what is necessary or not necessary. You know, I talked about just least privileged access, that kind of stuff. That's kind of what AI does. And it's, it's going to be in the core of identity solutions going forward, whether it's SailPoint or anybody else. Um, and what it's going to do, way at SailPoint, what we're trying to do is ease that transition to where it's not just using ML or AI because it's cool, even if it is. It's a very focused applied use case. And also, as it makes those recommendations and as it does that automation on the enterprise's behalf, it tries to explain why it's doing that. And that transparency is huge and it's key in any machine learning application, particularly this one. Because then it says, look, you shouldn't approve this access or this uh, developer shouldn't be allowed access to these marketing resources, whatever it is, it explains why. Uh, everyone like this person doesn't have this access or this grants access to sensitive data and that's a particularly bad idea for this temporary employee. Whatever it is, it translates it and tries to explain it to the human so that if it's a decision that's table stakes, like if the machine learning algorithm is like, well, I'm 99% sure that this should be approved or rejected, we can start to transition those decisions over to machine learning. In the future, the goal should be not certifying 300 entries per person. What it should be is have the ML, the identity AI, the automation go through and having learned from historical patterns and policy that you've inputted a little bit of uh, to make decisions on its own. And then when it finds those boundary cases, when it finds those edge cases where it's not entirely sure, then it's going to actually broadcast to the end user and say, I think this is the right answer, but you tell me. And now we're cooking with gas because we not only do we have machine learning and computer intelligence, so to speak, now we also have human intelligence, right? And they're educating each other. As the machine makes decisions and explains it to the human, the human's like, oh, that totally makes sense. And it's in the back of their head for next time. And then if the computer's wrong and the human corrects it, the machine's like, oh, well, that's something new I just learned. And so now it's a virtuous cycle where both together propel you forward. And the only way for a modern identity infrastructure to exist is to have that kind of autonomy, autonomous system, almost like a self-driving car where it just works and then asks you for edge cases. Thanks, Mike. And to the second uh, half of the question about implementations we've done using Identity AI, I can take that. Um, I know of a, a number of implementations that we've done using that. For instance, uh, another accelerator that Agile has is our RBAC accelerator, which helps to kind of define uh, you know, an RBAC program and a lot of the role structure for an RBAC program. And then being able to uh, combine that with Identity AI to kind of use Identity AI to continue the role modeling and establish the governance, kind of like what Mike was saying, where you have these roles and now you're using them in a certification environment to be able to say, okay, these roles exist, these roles grant this access. I think that this access should be, you know, grant, you know, having uh, help, you know, using the certification and also the assignment criteria to be able to say, okay, I know these roles, you know, these roles exist for these users, but should they exist for this new user coming in? You know, like Mike was saying, the identity AI, AI uh, tool can learn and be able to say, okay, should it be granted to this user? Well, based on, you know, these reasons, I think it should or should not. And then the administrators can say yes or no, or the certifiers can say yes or no, and the tool is going to learn, or the end user even, in the case of a certification, is going to learn. Uh, and it helps them, you know, it helps everybody. The tool is going to learn and be more accurate, but also the end users are going to have faster certifications. Um, so we've definitely used Identity AI uh, in implementations and worked with it um, to enhance, you know, implementations uh, in multiple regards. Perfect. Thanks, guys. It looks like um, no more questions are coming in and we're right up on time. So I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their their time today and you know, hopefully seeing you in the next one.